My name's Mary Ann White, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm the date of my last drink is September the 2nd, 1977, and for that I am extremely grateful. And I want to add, I don't ever, ever want to drink again. Uh, and that probably is the most important thing I can say for myself up here tonight. I um, would like to thank everybody that stood up, um, all the committee members and everybody who's chaired a meeting and everybody who has uh, done anything to make this conference possible. I have been in South Texas since 1984, and I have heard about Crested Butte uh, almost from the very beginning of my time down there. And uh, what a blessing. I, I have a list of people that I need to thank, but I'm just going to kind of lump all of you together. Uh, what you have done, and for a woman like me to admit this is probably telling you more than I really want to tell you, is that those of you that I have met so far and those of you that I will meet have weaseled your way into my heart. And I hope that in the next hour and what I said in my prayer in the, on my knees in the ladies' restroom in there was that somehow or another that God would use me as an instrument and somehow or another I would weasel my way into your heart also. Um, I have some wonderful news. I have some news that is just far exceeds anything that I have ever heard in a long, long time. And the good news is that Alcoholics Anonymous works. Uh, I have some bad news. Alcoholics Anonymous works very slowly. <laughs> it was explained to me that sobering up in Alcoholics Anonymous was like being kicked to death by rabbits. <laughs> I, uh, I, you know, I'm going to share a lot about me with you all because it's important. I came in as a woman locked into herself. Uh, I was full of secrets. I was full of, I'm not going to tell them that. That was a big one with me. I'm never going to tell anybody that. So it was important for me. I have a good friend, Mace Hill, who says to me, Marianne, you will stand up at the podium and bleed, won't you? But it is important that I let you know what I'm really like. To let you know, uh, Joe Ben and I were talking about this earlier at that we really are, most alcoholics are very lonely people. And most of us are very odd and strange and peculiar. My husband still says on the weird shit meter I'm a 10. <laughs> <laughs> so it's important that I let you know what goes on inside of me. And, you know, you talk about this blonde hair and this facade. I was one of these women who, um, who I, uh, uh, I, they always referred to me as she'd been drinking. That was the only way I can tell you is she'd been drinking. <laughs> you know, if I was at the grocery store or the school or at church, she'd been drinking. And, and what I wanted to be was some kind of a woman that was forceful, that, that could, could, present a point, and primarily present a point to my husband. That was always the one I was trying to make the point with. And what would happen is I would get drunk, and I would start to cry. That was just the way I was, and because the alcohol just did, oh, it just screwed me up horribly. What I wanted to be was like a woman I heard about the other day. This woman was my, I, she's my ideal. And she works for the airlines, and she it was one of those days, probably it was the United commuter after I flew in on it, where the, there were all these backups, and it was just a terrible backup. And, and you know how we are when we can't get on our airplane, we're up there and we're getting in line and we're wanting on the next flight, and there was a gentleman there who was probably an alcoholic. And he got, he jumped the queue, he jumped the line, and he got up there and he st st said to the woman, do you know who I am? And without missing a beat, she reached over and got the microphone that went out all through the auditorium, all through the airport, and said, I have a little lost man here. <laughs> and I thought, that's my kind of woman. Now, this most likely was an alcoholic because he was not going to have this. And he looked at her and he said, screw you, lady. And she said, you'll have to get in line for that also. 
Now, that's my kind of woman. And that's the way I wanted to be able to converse, and I never could converse like that. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you were in, in Minneapolis, but I was there, and it was just grand and glorious. We did need to get everybody in Minnesota. Uh, oh, it's just magnificent. The very first conference I ever went to, the international conference I went to, was in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1980, and it was exciting. And there were 45,000 of us walking around New Orleans, and you know, they, the mayor was giving a press conference, and he was—he had all these reporters around, and they had the, the microphone in the mayor's face, and some were asking very decent civil questions, and then there was this one pesky reporter, and he was asking all kinds of inane questions, like, you know, how are we going to move all these people around? And I hear after these people get sober, they turn into good little eaters, and how are we going to feed all these people? And then he asked the one last dumb question of the mayor. He stuck the microphone in the mayor's face, and he said, Mayor... Do you think Alcoholics Anonymous works? And the mayor reared back and he said, Son, this town is in big trouble if it doesn't. <laughs> I, uh, I want to thank the two speakers last night. They were absolutely magnificent. Uh, I, uh, we, need, we do need to give them a round of applause. God, what touching, honest, open stories. Uh, God, that was just unbelievable. And the two of them said they did not come from alcoholic homes. Well, you're talking to one now who did. And uh, I am a classic product of an alcoholic home. Uh, I also am a classic product of a member, of when the member of a family of al that has alcoholism got sober. And my father sobered up in alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous, and my father died a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was this bratty little child who came along when my father was 45 and my mother was 40 and I was an only child. And that would lead you to believe I was some long sought after miracle. But what, uh, what happened, I found out later on, is that my, they, they were doing very fine without me and my mother would talk very freely about the many abortions that she had had before I was born. And that fed in, that was the beginning of the feeding in to those feelings inside of me that I was worthless, that there was something wrong with me, something very wrong with me. My father had drunk up most of the money that he had earned, and he ended up, because he had injured his body so badly, he had, inj he had ended up in a charity hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. And my mother had to work, and somebody had to go visit this man in the hospital. So at the age of nine, my mother would tell me how to get on the bus and transfer two or three times in a very large city and find this old charity hospital and wind my way through the bowels of this hospital, through the back, through underneath, and find this charity ward where all these sick old men were. And um, what happened is that this hospital had the crazy people there. And they had them on the ground floor. And there was no air conditioning, and they had bars on the windows. And at the age of nine, I heard and I saw the sights and the sounds of insanity. And I saw it, I can't remember how many days or how many weeks or how many months. But I never once went home and said to my mother, I'm afraid. I never once said to her, please don't make me do that anymore. So see, it talks about, the book tells us that the problem was centered in my mind. I have it from the very, very get-go. It was explained to me that alcoholism is a learned inadequacy to life, which means that I learned very well how to do life very poorly. And on the outside, that's not what we're talking about. It was on the inside. It was my reaction and my responses to what was going on in my life. Uh, I had this sick father and this old mother, and what I knew is that somehow or another I had to get out of there. And at the age of 15, I sought the, the avenue that women of my generation did. I thought, if I can find a man to get me out of this, then I'll be okay. And I found him, a very fine young man, and I thought, I'll become Mrs. Wright, and that's all there is to it. And I will just leave that happy life, and I'll get away from this responsibility. That's really what it was. The longer I'm sober, I realize that as an alcoholic, I run from responsibility. Part of my discipline and my exercise now is when that feeling inside of me says run, it means I have to stop and stand still. 
And usually it means stop and stand still and hurt. And that is probably one of the most difficult things I have learned in the last five years of my sobriety. So I found this, um, this fine young man at the age of 15. I am married and I am pregnant and we are living on the um, eastern slope of the Rockies on a cattle, working cattle ranch. And I cooked on a wood stove and I had no running water and I would go to Glenwood Springs to the grocery store. So being out here, my husband asked me this morning if I would had any, any feelings of remembrances and, and I did, I did. At the age of 15 I was out here. And we had two children and we looked like that our life was going on just the way it would in the movies. And what happened is that the disease of alcoholism, which is my perception of life, which is my ability to cope with life. And cope to me means dealing successfully. That's what cope means. That was all going to, you know, it talks about that at some point in the book, and my home group, by the way, is, is a big book study. My home group is the Early Morning Fellowship of Men and Women. We meet at 6.30 in the morning on Mondays and Fridays. And we now have digressed to not only studying the book front to back, but we have slowed it down to where we are reading one sentence at a time. And the book has come alive again for me. Yeah, and the young lady last night talked about being a cheerleader for God. And, you know, I, I can't get my behind off the ground to cheer, but I can be part of the pom-pom squad. I, I mean, I, I can, yeah, and the big book. I mean, that is just, I am on fire again about the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So we, I have these two kids, and we're moving all around the country, and I am pointing the finger at him all the time. It's him, it's him, it's him. He's the problem. If, if he would only do what I wanted him to do, and if he would only love me more, and all that litany, that, that horrible litany that we have, and especially women alcoholics have, but it's always somebody else. Somebody else did it to me, and oh, poor me. One of my favorite songs with Peggy Lee is That All There Is. Oh, I just <laughs> loved that. I mean, that was just magnificent drinking music. And, so, I mean, I had, I really even hadn't had a drink, and he finally graduates from college, and we're on the dream, and we're, uh, the night happened. One of the tests to find out if you're an alcoholic is that most alcoholics can remember the night they took the first drink. People that are not alcoholic can't remember that. Uh, there is also another test that I've heard about recently. In fact, it's a story about to tell if you're really an alcoholic. That you go into a bar and you take these three people. There's a there's a non-drinker or non-hard drinker, and then there's a hard drinker, and then there's an alcoholic. And you sit them at the bar, and you bring three glasses of booze, and you put a fly in each one. <laughs> and what happens is that the person that is non-alcoholic, that is not an alcoholic, will, or is not even a hard drinker, will push it away and order a diet coke. And the person that is a hard drinker will say to the bartender, you know, I would like another drink. Please take the fly out. And the alcoholic picks the fly up by the nape of the neck and says, Spit it out! Spit it out! <laughs> No, I crossed that line the very first night I took the drink. And what happened to me was this. I took the drink in the elixir that it talks about. All of a sudden, I had an answer to problems that I didn't even know I had. I had a solution to life. And the most important thing that happened to me that night was that it softened the world. It changed you all. Yes, it changed me. You know, when I sobered up, I sobered up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And there was a rehab by the name of Chip Chet Farms, if that isn't the <laughs> a one that will make you think twice. And they gave a they gave on their fourth step inventory, even though I do not go by those things, it says scratch the surface of an alcoholic and you find an idealist. And I, that means that an idealist cannot live in this imperfect world without some kind of a crutch or some kind of a buff. So I was not a bad person. I was an idealist, and this hard, cruel world was just too awful to look at. And when I took the drink, it smoothed it all out. It just softened it all up. Uh, my drinking career, and I'm not going to spend a long time on it, it seemed like it lasted forever. Uh, I'm one of these housewives who did a lot of drinking at home. 
Uh, I was the one who carried the big purse who had the bottle in it and who worried about how where she was going to, you know, if you don't think this isn't a disease, sit at meetings and have people compare these kind of beginning thoughts. I mean, we all did the same thing. How am I going to get rid of the bottles? What am I, you know, I would add water to my husband so that he wouldn't know that I had had any. And then the round of liquor stores that we would go to, and always the lie, trying to tell somebody that I'm going to have a party, and how many glass, how many people can I serve out of this? You know, all the silly things that 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 we do, and you know, like who's watching? Who cares? But we care. I thought the world absolutely revolved around me. I uh, I've had a lot of hard lessons along that line, and one of the lessons I've learned, or I've had to learn along that line has to do with the six and seven step. And I'm here to tell you, be very careful what you pray for in Alcoholics Anonymous because that has to deal with the defects of character. And every day, and I heard Joe Ben talk about it this morning, he says the third step prayer and the seventh step prayer, and I do also. And I say it exactly like it's out, outlined in the big book. I mean, I have learned to follow the directions. And I say it, and then I read in the grapevine that, it's, that this gentleman wrote a story. He thought it was important that, that you name the baby, that you name the character defect that you felt that you had that was eating your lunch today or that you and God were going to work on. And so I thought, well, that's, I like that. So I'd say it the regular way, and then I'd say the seven-step prayer, and I would list first jealousy. You know, our book says that most terrible of all human emotions. And jealousy is a character defect that I have been dealing with. It is some of the first, first feelings that I can remember probably as a four-year-old child is being jealous of somebody else, wanting something that they have and not being happy for someone else when they had something good. So I say jealousy, and then I say self-pity and self-loathing. And then I kind of lump the rest of them together of greed and gluttony and sloth and pride. And this, I had to add, at the insistence of my sponsor, <coughs> is vanity. <laughs> and if you all haven't noticed, I spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money on how I look on the outside. And um, it was pointed out that I probably needed some help in that area. One of the reasons I didn't go to a treatment center, I almost got struck sober, is they told me they took your makeup away. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want any of that. And uh, so I say vanity. Well, this had this event of praying for vanity, that God helped me with this defect of character of vanity. <clears throat> I had an example of how God works. Uh, one morning, I get out and walk, usually every morning, and I was out walking, and I had said my prayers, and I had done my meditating, and done my reading, and came back in and got in the shower, and I went, started with my hair, and it went into place. Oh, it went into place real easily. And my makeup went on just like that. And... Um, I was going to wear this dress that I had really wanted. I had watched it at the store go on sale, and for you men, maybe it's a shotgun or a pair of hiking boots or a fishing rod or something that you really wanted badly. Well, I wanted this dress, and I mean, I waited till this dress went on sale, and I got this dress, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to wear that dress to the meeting today. And I put this dress on. Now, bear in mind, I have just said a prayer about vanity, and I am looking in the mirror, and I'm saying, not too shabby. You know, you may be a grandmother, but you can probably turn a, still turn a few heads. And what happened is I dismissed that thought because I remember thinking, you know, Marion, you've said a prayer about vanity, and then it was like, oh, well. <laughs> and what happens is, you know who I knew was talking to me that time? I said, as I said, I sobered up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there was a woman there who was a streetwalker. I sobered up with her, and her name was Liz, and I was absolutely fascinated by Liz. I mean, I would sit next to Liz at all the beginner's meetings, and I would look down at her hands, and I'd think, oh, my God, when she had those hands. <laughs> and then I remember thinking, I wonder if she'll teach me what she does with those hands. <laughs> 
And she came in one day and she said, you know, she said, my alcoholism is talking to me. My alcoholism is telling me, he sits right here on this left-hand shoulder, he never goes away, and he tells me things like, you don't have to go to the meeting, you don't have to pray, you don't have to call your sponsor, you know, you're being brainwashed, all this stuff. And she said, you know, I had to give my alcoholism a, na my alcoholism a name. And I said, you did? What's his name? And she said, it's that motherfucker Leroy. <laughs> So Leroy is talking to me and telling me that I can just discount this prayer about vanity that I had just prayed. <laughs> and um, so I go on about my day. I mean, it's a glorious day. I go to my meeting, and I'm excited. And, it's, you know, there's no such thing as a bad meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. There is not. Some are better than others, but there's no such thing as a bad meeting. So I go to my meeting of AA, and then I, it was a noon meeting, and I went out, and I went to the restroom, and then I visited with my friends, and then I went about my day in Corpus. And, you know, I'm buying things. I'm in and out of two shopping malls. I'm going to the post office. I'm going to the cleaners. I'm doing all the things that busy women who are sober and responsible do. And what happened is I began to perceive that I was getting a lot more attention than I normally got. And the attention went along these lines that there were men digging in the street and they would stop digging and they would lean on their shovels and they would point at me. And I remember thinking, I think I'll walk a little further tomorrow. This walking is really paying off. I remember throwing my shoulders back up like this. And, and then there were two little boys riding bicycles down the street and they almost had a wreck. And I thought, you know, they're pointing and poking and... And I thought, you know, those young men have good taste. They will most likely marry women who keep themselves very well. And I was at a shopping mall, and there was a nice young man, and, and he, he was so enthralled by the way I looked, he turned around, almost ran into a post. I mean, and I thought, I hope his wife keeps herself up. I mean, all these thoughts are going through my head. So I go to a small shop, and I meet one of my friends. You know, the, it talks about meeting each other is the high point of our day sometimes. And I go up to Jenny, and I said, and she goes, what's wrong with your skirt? I said, what do you mean what's wrong with my skirt? And what had happened is some four hours earlier, I had tucked the bottom of my skirt into the top of my pantyhose. <laughs> And I had been mooning half of Corpus Christi for four hours. Now, I watch your faces when I tell that story. And I was in a town not to be named. And there was a woman, and she was appalled that I told this story. I mean, she was absolutely appalled. Her jaw dropped down, and she came up to me afterwards, and she said, I am so glad you had on underpants. <laughs> And I said, I didn't have on any underpants. <laughs> so one must be quite careful what one prays for in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, you know, my drinking just goes on and on and on, and I'm being goofy and crazy and doing nutty things and hiding the bottle and, and, uh, uh, demanding attention from people and doing inappropriate things. Um, when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and they talked about how we had hurt people that we loved, I said I hadn't done that. You see, I had cooked their food and I had washed their clothes and I had been the brownie leader and I had been the Sunday school teacher and I had done all the things that people who look like they're okay do. When it came to a fourth step and it talked about the word honesty, and stealing. It took me a long time to remember this, that uh, my husband and I were having one of our fights when we were living in Bethesda, Maryland, and my son was 13 years old. Do you know that impressionable age of 13? And my daughter was 15, and my husband and I were fighting, and I was losing the battle, and I um, had to get out of it fast, and I decided I would throw myself down this half flight of stairs to shift the focus from uh, me losing the fight to, um, to the fall. And I tumbled down the steps, and at that point, my 13-year-old son came out of his bedroom, and my 15-year-old daughter came running down the hall. 
And my 13-year-old son has tears running down his cheeks, and he said, stop it, stop it. Now, he has no idea what he has just seen. He has no idea if he's seen his father push his mother down the stairs, or he has no idea if his drunken mother has fallen down the stairs one more time. So when I began to get honest and I realized that I had stolen that security and that, 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 that freedom, that uh, feeling of warmth, that feeling of that bad things don't happen in a home, I had stolen that from yet that young man and that young woman that night. And there are many other instances. You know, there are times we talk about that this is a fellowship of men and women. Yes, this is a fellowship of men and women. But there is a special horror to being a woman alcoholic. There is a special horror to being a woman alcoholic that is a mother. And I'm telling you, I can be sober for 900 years and do everything that Alcoholics Anonymous asks of me and then more and never truly, fully make up to my children. But with your help, I try. I, uh, <clears throat> I, I am going in and out of blackouts. You know, it's interesting, the summer, my sobriety date is September the 2nd, 1977. So this summer is when I was doing this, this hitting the bottom and then bouncing up off the bottom and then going down at the bottom again. And one of the things that, was, that, that happened to me is that my family members did not, and we talked about this, Duke, if you're in here, we did not, they did not slide the pillow in underneath me one more time. They let me hit my bottom. And my bottom was that I literally became a daily, almost hourly drinker. That I was locked into my, uh, the prison that was my home, that um, I could not function. You know, it is, it is hard for me to imagine that today. You know, when I got out on that hill and I'm walking this morning and I'm looking out and I'm thinking, my God, 23 years ago, if anybody would have told me that I'm going to stand up and share my innermost thoughts with 700 people and be comfortable doing it, and that I am as productive and as my life is so full. You know, we use words, we use words in such a cavalier manner. And the words that we use so cavalier are rich and full. I've heard it, I've been to three meetings since I've been here, and I've heard those words three times. Our lives are rich. They are rich and they're full. And um, so I'm bouncing along the bottom and I'm drinking around the clock and I'm feeling sorry for myself. And I remember making the conscious decision to turn away from God. And I know I did that because I knew that I really was living against my own, the moral values that I had. I was living against them. Uh, I'm going in and out of a blackout. My husband's gone on a long trip. My kids are in school and I get up to go into the bathroom after laying there feeling sorry for myself and I look in the mirror and I got the window and I pray that each one of you in this room that is alcoholic has gotten the window and the window consisted of probably no more than 15 seconds but I looked at myself as I really was not as I wanted to be but as I really was and I uttered what I believed was the true prayer of Alcoholics Anonymous and most of you know what it is it's God, help me. And I remember thinking, it's not his fault. It's not his fault. It's not, it's not Bob's fault. It's not the fault of the fact that I've moved all around the country. It's not the fact that I've had these two young ch children at a young age. It's not anybody's fault. It's me. And when we come to that point deep in our innermost self, that it's us the life begins. I had to be detoxed. I had to go by ambulance. Uh, I went to St. Francis Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And for those of you that have been in any of those northeastern cities, it's one of those old brownstones. I mean, it's an ugly old hospital. And they put the crazy people up on the ninth floor with the alcoholics. And they have a high porch there. And they had to put a barbed wire fence about around it because so many of us kept leaping off the ninth floor. and. Uh, that I went into detox up there, thought my life was over, and my life was over. My life was finished. The Africans have a word, it's called chakwa, meaning it's gone. I uh, 
went in, we were with the crazy people and the alcoholics. I mean, it, but it's interesting. I knew who was crazy, and I knew who was an alcoholic. It was that identity that we have with one another. <laughs> you know, it's much like a friend of mine who takes a meeting like that into a facility like that. He takes an AA meeting to a, in Texas, and he, he always goes up to the head nurse, and he said, Now, I'm a member of AA. I'm going to have an AA meeting. I want you to sort out the alcoholics. I want you to put them over here. I'm going to have an AA meeting. She never looks at a chart. She never looks at a piece of paper. She never looks at anything. She nudges this man and pushes this woman. And he finally asks her, he said, how do, you, how do you know who's an alcoholic and how do you know who's crazy? And she said, it's very, very simple. She said, the, the crazy people sit there very quietly. The alcoholics are always up at the desk telling us how to run this place. <laughs> and I knew that I had come home. And I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I knew that this lost woman... This woman had been so lost and so locked into herself and so frightened and so unable to communicate. And I don't mean verbally. I mean communicate heart to heart. I was one of those women who I didn't want to hug you. And when this meeting is over, I want you all to come up and love on me so much. It means so much. I didn't want to hug you because I didn't want to feel your heart beat. If I felt your heartbeat, it meant I gave you some kind of control or some kind of power. And what it really meant is you had the power to hurt me. It meant I was letting another human being into my life, into my little tiny circle. And so there was a man there. He told his story. It was an AA meeting they brought to this loony bin place. And he got up and he talked about how he stabbed his wife in a blackout. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in with drug addicts and murderers. And I said to the little nurse, I'm going. And she said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to faint. And I fainted at my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> but hope was born. I, uh, I, I came to AA in Pittsburgh, and the Fox Chapel group was my home group. And a woman called on me because the counselor had told her that there was this crazy woman who probably had an alcohol problem, and would she please see if she wanted to go to AA. And she came in and she said to me, do you want to get sober or do you want to want to get sober? And I thought, I want to get sober. And I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous outside of the treatment center and I fell in love with AA. Oh my God, I fell in love with it. I was, you people hooked me from the very first meeting. I mean, I brought cookies for six months. I wouldn't let anybody else have the cookie commitment. I mean, I was just a rabid on this. And it was, I would go to conferences and stay up all night and drink coffee and eat sugar and couldn't figure out why I couldn't sleep and, and come home from a conference and want to tell my husband all about it. And he said, if you had such a good time, why do you look so awful? I mean, it was just, I was just on this. And what I would do is I saw the steps and I remember thinking, no, I have a slight case of alcohol alcoholism, that I, I was like being pre-pregnant. I caught it real early, and that I'm not going to have to work these steps. And what happened was, I got crazier and crazier and crazier. I sobered up where they had beginner's meetings, and I would go to meetings, and people would say things to me like, Marianne, the woman I was drank. The woman I was will drink again. The only vehicle for me to change so that I am not the same woman was the working of the steps. I heard things like that until I had done a fourth and fifth step, I was walking around with an untreated case of alcoholism. But there was that block in me, and I know today, standing at this podium, it was pride. The little black book, which is not conference approved, but there is a line in there where it says, pride stands sentinel at the door which means that pride lets no one in. And pride for me means that I won't ask for help, that I won't let you know what's really going on inside of me, that I won't put myself in a vulnerable position, that I will insist upon having the right answers for every situation. That pride for me is saying, is not saying, I don't know, I don't know is not in my vocabulary. I, I always knew the answer. And at 17 months sober, my husband came in, the man that I had been married to since I had been 15 years old. And this may not sound like a big deal to you, but it was my big deal, and it was my turning point 
into the healing curve of Alcoholics Anonymous. At 17 months sober, he came in and he said, Mary Ann, it's not that I don't love you, it's just that I can't live with you anymore. And I thought, here it is. Here it is. What I had worked so hard at and why I really didn't want you to get to know me was the fact that I knew deep down inside that there was nothing there. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous with real long bangs, and the reason I did that was because my mother had told me that the eyes were the window to the soul, and I didn't want anyone looking into my eyes. I wanted nobody to look in my eyes because I knew that there was nothing there, that there was no character, that there was no integrity, that there was no perseverance, that there was no strength. All of the character assets that, that good people possess, I knew I did not have. And I thought, here it is. I've got trouble. I'm going to have to drink. And what happened is, I come, come from the school of Alcoholics Anonymous that if it's your home group night, you go to your home group. And Tuesday was Tuesday night, and I went to my home group. And I walked in looking pretty much like I do right now, and they said, how are you? And I said, I'm fine. And later on in the kitchen, I collapsed in their arms. And I told them the truth the truth. And you know, in Joe Ben's meeting today, the word that kept going around the room, I, um, the topic was turning it over. But you know what the group conscience of that meeting came up with? Trust. See, I didn't trust this process. I thought that, there, that it was not going to work. And what happened is I began to trust the process that night because I was in so much pain. And I told him the truth, and I uttered. This is the end of side one. Turn your cassette over and continue to play on the other side. I can't do this anymore by myself. I just can't. I can't joust at these windmills anymore. I can't fight this world all by myself. Will you please help me? And I said, I don't know what the words mean in this book. I don't know how to do these steps. What do you mean by a principle? I'm a woman who looks like should know what, a, what the word principle means. I don't know what it means. What does it mean to have integrity? What does it mean to be honest? What does it mean to be a friend among friends and a worker among workers? What does it mean to be happy for somebody else's good fortune? I don't know how to do this. I don't know. Help me. And what happened is that night, Alcoholics Anonymous, the old timers of Alcoholics Anonymous, who had been waiting with folded arms for me to come out of my locked shell, Alcoholics Anonymous kicked into overdrive. And those people hand carried me through the working of the steps. And they hand carried me in the simple instructions that were like Greek to me, just Greek to me. You know, I was full of yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. And they said, Mary Ann, yes, but is the mating call of assholes. <laughs> she did, and I did a fifth step with the priest, and I did it with Father Ben, and I, I, what happened to me is what I was scared to death was going to happen. I started to cry. And they were not those crocodile tears that I had cried drunk. These were genuine, real tears, because my fourth step had a lot to do with feeling emotions that I should have felt a long time ago. There was the grief when my mother died, when I was 18 years old. And they left me in the hospital room with her, and she was in the throes of dying, and none of it's very pleasant. And I was so frightened. I was so afraid. And when it was time for me to leave, they said to me, give her a kiss. And I was afraid to I mean, it's all those things that I could have, I should have, all the, those words that we're not supposed to use, 
but that if I had been a healthier person that I would have done. So I had grief. The other thing I found out in my fourth step was that I, one of my greatest character defects was that I had used love as a weapon. I had withheld love. I had manipulated love. I had withheld the pat on the back. And what's that all tied in with? That's tied in with that character defect of jealousy, the one that I've talked to you about. I'm, I'm on my way to be a single woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. And for the young gentleman who talked about going to the singles meeting last night, my heart just went out to you. I mean, I know this. I, I've been there. This, it's unbelievably difficult, and it's unbelievably euphoric. You know, how can it? It's like coming to a conference for the first time. I don't know how many of you have the experience I do. I love these people. I hate these people. I want to go home. I want to stay here forever. I mean, this is just, this is, I feel wonderful. I feel awful. I mean, this is just us. This is the way we are. The book says we're erratic. We are erratic people. So I'm living a single life in Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not see my husband for two years, and I realized today that it was a necessity that we be separated. Because if he and I had not been separated, I would not be sober tonight. Because I had to get to the point where it was not his fault anymore. That it was all about me. And I began to work. I have a one, my favorite pigeon says something that is just so wise. She said, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is it's all about me. The bad news is it's all about me. <laughs> the problem is inside me. You know, I don't come from the school of sobriety that says that it's going to be all right. I don't. It may go to hell. It may go to hell in a handbasket. But if I practice the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, I will be all right. And see, that's the difference. I am a woman who's walked around on the face of this earth terrified that something would come and knock out my underpinnings, and I wouldn't have, would not be able to handle it. I don't know what not handling it means. I do know. When I was getting ready to do my fourth and fifth step, I talked to a good friend of mine, and I said, Ed, I'm really afraid that when I do my fifth step, I'm going to go around the bend. And he said to me, Mary Ann, that's okay. I've seen it happen. I said, what do you mean you've seen it happen? He said, I've seen somebody go around the bend. And I said, what happens then? And he said, we hold your hand and we bring you back. And for some reason that gave me great comfort. See, what happens is I trust you people. Never trusted anybody in the whole wide world, but I trust you people. Bob and I were separated for two years, and then I had a car accident where I hit a man on a bicycle, and, uh, thank you, uh, excuse me, <laughs> I hit a man on a bicycle, and he ended up on the hood of my car, and uh, I got ringed by the people where I was, where I was, and I had to, the car was still in this man's name, my husband's name, and so I told this woman, this angel, she stuck her head in the car, and she said, is there anybody I want you to call? You want me to call? And I said, yes. And he picked me up at the police station, and we went home, and we sat down like two people who had a long history. And we began to talk, and what I remember thinking is, my, my, how he's changed. <laughs> and he hadn't changed at all. What, he had done, what had happened is that Alcoholics Anonymous had begun to do its work. Let me tell you about following directions in Alcoholics Anonymous. Let me tell you about doing things that you don't want to do. And doing things by road in Alcoholics Anonymous. We also talked in the meeting earlier this morning about getting out of self and how we get out of self. And when I'm working at this teeny tiny little job that I had when Bob and I were separated and I'm making minimum wage and I'm driving this 10-year-old car and I am barely making ends meet and, and I had got a call that, that I needed to go to St. Francis Hospital and make a 12-step call. Well, by God, I went over there and it was snowing and it was cold and made this 12-step call and let me tell you, those little individual rooms began to look pretty good over there and I went back to work and then it was one of those snowstorms in and for those of you that, that are it paralyzes the town they weren't ready for it and I usually had a 20-minute ride home and it took me four hours to make it home that night and I, we lived on a hill and I got the car to the bottom of the hill and I couldn't get it any further and I thought I'm gonna have to walk up the hill and I walked up the hill and I got home and I'm wet and I'm cold and I'm hungry and I'm tired and it's Tuesday night and Tuesday night, as I told you, was my home group night. 
And what is happening to me is Leroy is telling me, you don't have to go tonight. It's okay. You went, you made a 12-step call. You've been to four meetings this week. You don't have to go. When she calls, you can lie to her. You can make it up at a later date. You can tell her it was just a, you, tell her you were sick. Uh, go ahead. Leroy says, tell her you were sick. You probably are getting sick. It's okay to tell her that. But you know what's happening all the while I'm talking like this? I'm getting my boots on. I'm getting ready to go. And what happens is I, uh, I'm, I had a pigeon who had a four-wheel drive, and she said, I'll meet you down at the bottom of the hill. If you can get down at the bottom of the hill, I'll take us to the meeting. So I thought, well, I'm going to take a shovel in case we both get stuck. And so I'm walking down with my boots on and my outfits on, and I've got the shovel over my shoulders, and I'm complaining and whining, you know, whining the way we do all the way down the hill. And I get down the hill, and gratitude began to kick in just momentarily. And I began to look at the snow out there, and it was just a beautiful sight. We lived down in the country beautiful sight, and all the snow was coming down, and I see these headlights coming across the, the road, and I thought it must be Peggy, and then I realized it's not Peggy, and it's a car, and a man rolls up, and he up, comes up, and he rolls down the window, and he said, do you know where the Fox Chapel Episcopal Church is? And I said, yeah, and he said, I'm looking for the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Whoa. I said, you just wait right here. I said, my friend, and we'll guide you. And I mean, it was like, God, this God stuff's really something. And I, mean, I was really impressed with this. And I got in the car, and I'm just talking to Peggy on and on and on about, look, isn't this just wonderful? And I get in with the shovel in the back seat, and, and we get to the meeting, and the rest of the story is that he had been at a business conference. He had sobered up in the same month, the same year that I had sobered up. He was at a business conference at a Holiday Inn about 10 miles away from there, and he realized he was on real shaky ground. It was a drinking meeting, and he really was in close proximity to taking a drink. And he called the Pittsburgh Intergroup office, and he said, where is the closest Alcoholics Anonymous meeting? I have to have one. And they said, well, we'll tell you where it is, but you'll never find it. And he said he had been driving around for 45 minutes, and he said he came up over the hill, and he uttered a prayer, and he said, God, if I'm going to find this meeting, you're going to have to send me an angel. <laughs> and there I was, <laughs> with my shovel. <laughs> you know, these are miracles in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is God speaking directly to us. He tells me, Marianne, hold on. Hold on, hold on. I'll give you a little bit of good stuff to bring you forward, pull you forward. Come on. There's greater stuff out there. There's better stuff out there. Hold on. Do the work. Do the work. Move on. We, uh, Bob came home and we got back together and our relationship is on a different footing. It is on a very different footing because the book tells us it has to be on a different footing. And we've been back together since 1981 and we moved to South Texas in 84. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, are there any alcoholics in the state of Texas? <laughs> Is there any AA in Texas? Uh, and I came to South Texas and fell in love. With, I mean, I love, we give our sobriety. I love everything about Texas Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, truly, truly, it is magnificent. We are the warmest, kindest, most generous, most loving bunch of people that you will ever find in your whole life. And I pray if you're not from Texas, it rubs off on you. I mean, it's just magnificent. Uh, I got involved down there, and I mean, I'm telling you, and what happened to me, I began to get a resentment list, and my resentment list now today consists only of members of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> if yours doesn't, you're not going to enough meetings. I, uh, I, I'm telling you, they were, you, and you know how you get on my list? You cross me. And how you cross me is you touch my ego. And in the last Three years have I have identified that feeling inside me when my ego gets touched. It is a physical feeling. It is a physical jerking. And I don't like it. And the immature person in me immediately defends or attacks. So I am just wrapped up tighter than a drum in Corpus Christi AA, and God said, that's about enough of this. And Bob came home one day, and he said to me, we're going to move one more time. 
I thought, oh, well, where now? And he said, we're going to move to Africa. <laughs> and in 1989, I moved to Zambia, Africa. And Zambia is not South Africa. Zambia is a third world country. Zambia, Zambia is right next to Ethiopia as far as AIDS, as far as poverty. There are 27 tribes in Zambia, and they are being held at bay by a thin paper wall. And I remember getting off the airplane in Zambia thinking, oh my God, Mary Ann, you have done it now. Uh, <clears throat> and I remember thinking, is the God that I know going to strike me drunk because I cannot get to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every footstitch? And the answer to that was no. And what I learned over there happens to most of us between the sobriety of 13 and 18 years, I hope. I learned to go inward. You see, that's what this quest is all about, is learning to go inside. You know, you can do a lot of things to get relief in Alcoholics Anonymous. You can go to 90 meetings in 90 days. You can even work with a new person and you're going to get relief. You can um, set up, tear down, you can call your sponsor, you can make 15 phone calls, and you will get relief. But if you want freedom, and there is a difference between relief and freedom, there must be the working of the steps at depth on the personality. And I had to have all the exterior stimulation that I had been used to taken away from. I had um, night guards, day guards, coiled barbed wire. We had, there was genuine reason for fear. We had um, uh, jail doors. We had bars on the inside of the window, bars on the outside of the window. I had, sometimes we had electricity, sometimes we didn't, sometimes we had water. I grew my own um, food. I ground my own meat. I made my own bread. Uh, all the things that were not humanly possible for me to do if I had not been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. For some people, they don't understand that correlation. But the correlation to me was this. God, show me the next right thing to do. God, help me. God, help me. Give me the intuitive thought. I give you, give you my day, God. Show me. Show me. It was full of, please show me. Please help me. Um, I got to two meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous in two years. And um, I got a phone call one day because the, the phone worked. And the lady said, uh, <laughs> the lady said to me, we have a 12-step call for you to make in your little town of Luancha, Zambia. I said, a 12-step call? And she said, yes, it's an African and it's a man. And I said, oh, my sponsor says I can't make a 12-step call on a man. And she said, oh, yes, you can, and oh, yes, yes, you will. And a man came to my door, a black man came to my door by the name of Costa Canuga. And he was of the Bimba tribe, and he brought his brother, <clears throat> and he spoke very little English. He did speak the English they do speak, but they speak their tribal language. And he began to tell me about how he had, the only thing he had had to drink in his life was Chibuku beer, and Chibuku is the home brew that the Africans brew for themselves, and how much trouble he had gotten into. And he worked in the mines, the copper mines there, and the copper mines were not even like our mines in West Virginia. These were very dangerous mines where men died daily. And I'm trying to tell him how I drank martinis in the Skirvin Hotel in Oklahoma City. <laughs> I thought, this is not working. This just is not working. This is just not going to work. And I had an extra big book, and I had an extra pamphlet called A Member's Eye View of Alcoholics Anonymous the one where it talks about the blind seeing and the deaf hearing and the lame walking and the poor in spirit. And I gave him that pamphlet and, you know, I really felt bad that I'd let Alcoholics Anonymous down. And what happened is three months later, there's a knock on the door and it's Costa Canuga and he had not had a drink in three months. And I'm telling you, I gave him a 12-step call that night. You would have been proud of me. I told him about the promises, and I told him what a glorious way of life this was. And I didn't have, I didn't have anything to give him. I didn't have a 90-day chip, and so I gave him my 10-year medallion. And I didn't have a 12, extra 12 and 12. And so I gave him my 10-year medallion that I had gotten in Corpus in my 12 and 12 that Jean had given me in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they are now in Zambia. I, uh, Bob came home one day and 
he had this look on his face, and I knew it was bad news. And the bad news was that the Zambian government wanted us out of there, and they wanted us out of there now on their terms. And he and I sat down that night as two adults, two people that had been married a long time, trying to formulate a plan to get our things out of a foreign country. And I was able to sit there and let him cry. Do you know how you do? One of the reasons that alcoholics, and I used to say alcoholic women, but it's all alcoholics, why we're such fixers, why we're such solution, why we're so solution oriented for other people, I learned it that night, is that if I can, if I can solve your problems, and minimize your pain, I can keep your pain away from me. And that night, at 13 years sober, I didn't say to hell with it, but I felt to hell with it. I am going to stop this, and I am going to see if Alcoholics Anonymous is right one more time. I am going to ride this out and see how far this emotional pain will go. Will I just blow apart? As far as feeling emotionally hurtful, well, I, what will happen to me? And what happened to me was that night I wrote it out. And I remember standing at the kitchen sink looking up at the full moon thinking, I can do this. I am not a coward. I have some wherewithal. I have some fortitude. Alcoholics Anonymous has imbued in me a spirit there is character in here as a result of doing things that I didn't want to do. I am, there is something inside of me. You know, we came back to Corpus and there's stories about my father-in-law in the nursing home about making amends to him, but the stories I want to wind up with have to do with my children. And it didn't take me very long. If this is a family disease, then why wouldn't I think that one of my kids is going to get it? And I watched him like a hawk when I first came in. Boy, I watched him. Who drank the way I did? Who ate cake the way I did? You know, who had that? Who brought four of anything when they only needed one? You know, all that we do. And so I didn't take me long to figure out who it was, and it was my son. And I went to Al-Anon. I went to Al-Anon, and I stood outside the door, and I said, I don't need to go in there. I don't need to go in there. I don't need to go in there. And I walked in, and the Al-Anon people embraced me with a warmth that I had not felt in a long time. You know, one of the things that was told to me, and it was told to me by Albert M., who was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and Sally, his wife, is a wonderful member of Al-Anon, he said, take your son through the steps. I said, Albert, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get him to AA so he'll go through the steps. And he said, no, no. He said, you and your head take him through the steps. I said, what do you mean? He said, say the steps and put your son's name in there. And I remember after being with my son one day, and he was so drunk. And I'm driving home, and the tears are coming down my cheeks. And I say, okay, I admitted that. Dan's powerless over alcohol, and Dan's life has become unmanageable. I come to believe that a power greater than Dan can restore Dan to sanity. And I make a decision to turn Dan's will and Dan's life over to the care of God as Dan understands him. I know today that that was surrender. I know that I had nowhere else to go with that pain. I have tried all the solutions that I could to get that kid sober. I got a phone call from him one day. He was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, June 19th, 1993, and he said, Mom, I want to quit. And I said, Call AA. And I got on the telephone. <laughs> I had a huge Al Anon slip. It was just <laughs> awful. I mean, I got on the phone in Corpus, and I'm down on the inner group in Tulsa, and I'm saying, I need the name of some men. What meeting should he go to? I mean, it was just awful. It was just terrible. <laughs> And I got on an airplane the next day and flew up there. <laughs> oh, it was just awful. And we went to a 6.30 in the morning meeting, and we drove up to the Unanimity Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and what happened is there was not a car there. And I thought, oh, my God. 
oh my God, please let somebody come. Please let somebody come that will say something that will save my child. And we came. And um, I'm going up the 3rd of August to give my son his seven-year chip. Uh, you know, this is a this is a wonderful way of. I've got a I've got a 12 year old granddaughter up there who tells me, Grandma, keep coming back. It works if you work it. Uh, <laughs> some last stories about the most precious thing. Now, my daughter is very precious to me also. My daughter's the one that is not an alcoholic, but I gave her all of those. I transmuted and transmitted to her all those unreasonable fears, those subliminal fears that an alcoholic mother does. Uh, I'd give her Alcoholics Anonymous as fast and furious as I can give her, but she didn't know she's getting it. I feed her everything that I possibly can from these meetings. I have five grandchildren. They are the high point of my life. They are the, they are the thing to me that for those of you that are grandparents, it is the most magnificent, magnificent feeling, especially to be a recovering person that has grandchildren. I heard Carolyn, I think it was, at the meeting today talk about she's a vital part of their life. Well, let me tell you, I'm a vital part of these five kids' lives. I mean, everything, every, I keep Continental Airlines hot to Tulsa and hot to Baltimore. I mean, I'm up there for graduations and dance recitals and football games. And, and you know how they talk about in the book, it says, we quit playing the director. Well, I ripped that page out of my book. <laughs> because what I did is I finally got, I directed this scene. Now, two summers ago, I got all five grandchildren. I thought if I could get them all in one place, I just wanted them all there so that I could just love on them and do all those things that grandmothers do. And I got it. I got all five of these kids in one motel room in Ocean City, Maryland. Now, <clears throat> one is 21, a 21-year-old girl. The boy is 19. I have a 15-year-old boy, a 16-year-old granddaughter, and a 12-year-old granddaughter. And what I thought is we'll all get dressed up, like I am now, and I will sit down, and they will all sit around my ankles, and they will tell me stories of what a wonderful grandmother I am, and I will tell them stories about giving them bottles and changing their diapers. I mean, it was just going to be miraculous. After they quit farting and fighting. <laughs> oh. 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 God, it was just terrible in this one room. 